So anyway, let's go more into how do we take the information that I just talked about, about the various different masks that we need to create, and how do we go through the steps in the fab in order to actually produce um, circuits. So the first thing we do is we start with a blank wafer. So it's basically just silicon and it's uh, p-type silicon and we'll go through the process or steps on building an inverter from the bottom up and the first step will be to form the N well that we're going to need for the PMOS transistors. So what we're going to do, uh, you can see down at the bottom here, we have a P substrate with absolutely nothing on it. It's just a, a large rectangle um, cross section saying that we have a P substrate. So the first thing that we want to do is we want to grow a protective layer of silicon dioxide over the top of the wafer. So we will grow the silicon dioxide on the wafer by taking this wafer, putting it into a furnace, raising the temperature up into the 900 to 1200 degrees Celsius range, so very hot, and then we'll flow through the furnace either water vapor or oxygen into the furnace. This will cause a chemical reaction between um, the oxygen and the silicon and will grow silicon dioxide at a certain rate depending on the temperature and concentration of oxygen or water vapor. And uh, once it gets to the thickness that we want, then we um, stop the flow of the oxygen and cool down the, the wafer and we can pull it out and we have our P substrate with silicon dioxide on it. So next we will spin on photoresist. Photoresist is a light sensitive organic polymer and this is a liquid that we will literally spin on the wafer. So our silicon wafer is a relatively thin flat round disc and so we will take this liquid, um, put some in the center of the wafer, maybe covering up to half or two-thirds up to the uh, edge of the wafer and then we will start spinning it at a very high speed of rotation and based on the uh, viscosity of the liquid of the polymer of the photoresist and the speed that we spin it at we can get a very repeatable and known thickness for the photoresist so getting a known repeatable thickness is very important so that we can expose it to light um, as we, after it dries, um, it will harden a little bit and we can then expose the photoresist to light and certain types of photoresist when we expose them to light will get uh, softer um, and more easy to take off and other ones are negative photoresist and they will get harder when you expose them to light. Um, so depending on the type of mask that you've created, if you've created a mask where the light goes through in the area where you've drawn something, um, you want uh, a different type of photoresist than if light is blocked where, you know, uh, you allow where you draw something um, in the layout. So, uh, so that depends on the type of photoresist that you want to use based on the type of mask that you created. So here is shown an example for our N-well mask. So in this particular case, uh, where we've drawn the N-well, we want to actually allow light to go through. So we'll be using the type of photoresist that softens when you allow light to go through the mask. So anywhere you've drawn the N-well um, layer in your layout, uh, you will get um, an area where light will go through and in all other areas uh, the light will be blocked and so after you've exposed the photoresist you can now ex now you can bathe the photoresist in a different liquid that's a developer and this will this developer will take off the photoresist in the area 
where the photoresist has been um, softened, um, in this case in the area where you've exposed it to light, and then it will leave the photoresist in all other areas. So now we have photoresist gone where we've exposed it to light and photoresist that stays in any area that wasn't exposed to the light. So the next step is we want to etch away the oxide anywhere where the photoresist was taken away. So we will take the silicon wafer, put it in hydrofluoric acid, um, this is one of the reasons why you need to be very careful if you're ever doing something in a silicon fab is there's very, very nasty chemicals that are being used for working on the silicon and silicon dioxide and doing all the stuff that you need to do in order to uh, etch the materials. Um, hydrofluoric acid will actually seep through your skin start eating through your bones um, if you get some on your skin. You don't want to do that. So, um, But as long as you're careful, in modern labs, most of that's behind, uh, it, it's inside the machines, and so people shouldn't get exposed to it in modern fabs. Uh, but, so you expose the hydrofluoric acid to the wafer. Uh, in most places, it's going to hit the photoresist and not do anything to the photoresist, but it will eat away silicon dioxide wherever it's exposed. So any place where the photoresist wasn't, um, the silicon dioxide gets etched away. So we now have the silicon dioxide gone in certain places where we want it gone. So next we use a different material to strip off the remaining photoresist. Um, Again, this uses some really nasty chemicals. Uh, I think it's a mixture of nitric acid and uh, sulfuric acid, and I can't remember what else at the moment. Um, but yeah, it's really bad, called a piranha etch. Um, takes away the photoresist. But we're left with now a wafer that has an silicon dioxide over part of it, and just open P substrate over the next part where we want a N well to be formed. So the next step is forming the N well. So this can be done through one of two ways. Uh, one is called diffusion or the other one's called ion implantation. Um, with diffusion, what we'll do is we'll just place the uh, silicon wafer into a furnace at high temperature with arsenic gas. And the hot arsenic gas uh, will now start diffusing into the solid p-type silicon and as it diffuses it goes to a certain depth. Um, they, you know, depending on the concentration of the arsenic in the gas and the temperature um, it will diffuse at a certain rate and once it gets to the depth that you want it, you can stop and then you'll have an end well formed with a certain depth and a certain concentration of arsenic in it. A different way is using ion implantation where you'll actually shoot arsenic ions at the wafer. They'll get implanted based on how, how excited or how fast you shoot them. They'll get implanted to a certain depth and that will uh, give you um, the, the end well depth that you want. Um, and either way, uh, in both cases, the silicon dioxide will block the arsenic ions from getting into the uh, p-type substrate wherever you didn't want the end well, which is where the silicon dioxide is. So now that you've got the end well formed, you can strip off the remaining oxide that you no longer need, again using the hydrofluoric acid. Now we're back to having a bare wafer like we started with, but we have a bare wafer with an end well in it. Um, and so uh, now we can go on and do the next set of steps that we want. So subsequent steps will involve a similar um, 
method, similar series of steps in order to create or remove uh, the materials that we either want or don't want. So let's go on to the, the next step um, that we'll need. So the next step is um, putting our polysilicon down and the polysilicon will also be used um, for uh, both basically for our gate region and so what we're going to want to do is next deposit a very thin gate oxide everywhere um, so this gate oxide depending on which uh, process technology you're you're talking about um, this this particular example is uh, about less than 20 angstroms so that's six to seven atomic layers of silicon dioxide um, and <clears throat> this is done with chemical vapor deposition or after the gate oxide is formed then we'll use chemical vapor deposition to put down a, a second silicon layer which is a polysilicon so it's not crystalline silicon it's it's crystals that are multiple crystals that it's not a single solid crystal but it's multi uh, crystalline so that's why they call it polysilicon um, and so we're gonna place the wafer in a furnace with silane gas SIH4 and this will start growing many small crystals on the surface of the oxide and we wind up as we're growing it we dope it um, and have it heavily doped so that it forms and acts as a fairly good conductor. So after we have um, the oxide everywhere and the polysilicon everywhere, um, we'll go back and use the lithography progress or process that we used previously. The same sort of process can be used that we used for the end well in order to develop um, and and form the the appropriate shape for our polysilicon um, so again the bottom of this foil is showing what the cross-section area looks like after we do everything and the the top area with the dashed black line is showing where uh, what it would look from a top-down view looking at the wafer and where the cross-section that we're looking at um, is that dashed black line. Um, so in order to perform this <clears throat> type of polysilicon, again what we do is we would put down a layer of photoresist, we would expose that photoresist to this mask um, that looks like the, the polysilicon U-shape that we have here, and then we would etch away, or not etch away, we would remove the photoresist where we want to um, expose the polysilicon. Um, so in this particular case, we would probably leave the, uh, the photoresist over the area where the gate is. And everywhere else, there would be no photoresist. Then we would use um, hydrofluoric acid or something else to etch away all the material back down to the substrate and, <coughs> and only keep what uh, remains underneath where the where the mask layer was and photoresist is, should be on top of that and then once we've etched all the way back down to the substrate we would remove the photoresist and be left with just the polysilicon and the gate oxide underneath it So modern processes uh, use what's called a self-aligned process. In effect, um, by patterning the gate region as early as they do, um, they can now use the gate oxide and the polysilicon over it um, as, in effect, a mask so that the N plus and P plus regions where you want your source and drain for your NMOS device and your PMOS device, uh, those will be self-aligned to the gate. You don't, 
you don't have to individually define where the source and drain are and try to align it to the gate before you form the gate. Since the gate's already there, we can just expose a given region and then when we implant um, the end diffusion or P diffusion, it will automatically wind up being surrounding the, the gate that it's uh, involved with. So we'll go through that in the next couple slides and I'll show you how that, that works. So for our end diffusion, um, we basically uh, pattern, we've already had our uh, gates formed. So after the gates are formed, now we go back and uh, grow oxide over the entire wafer um, in order to protect the substrate and the end well from areas that we don't want um, end diffusion to be inserted. And so we'll use the, the same sort of process that we used previously with the photolithography to we'll, we'll grow a gate or we'll grow a larger oxide over the entire surface of the wafer and then we'll put photolithography over it and after we put photolithography over it, we'll expose where the N plus diffusion regions are defined there to light and strip away the photolithography wherever, uh, wherever the N plus diffusion was. Once we strip it away, then we'll leave uh, the photo resist in areas where we don't want any end diffusion and we want to keep the oxide and we'll strip away the uh, photo resist in areas where the end plus diffusion should be. After we strip away the photo resist, um, then we'll strip away the oxide that's res uh, underneath that and finally, after we strip away the oxide, we take away all of the photoresist, leaving oxide only in regions where we don't want N plus diffusion. So this shows how we'll basically have some oxide in regions where we don't want N plus diffusion. So after we have just the oxide remaining. We'll either diffuse or use ion implantation in order to uh, get N plus regions in any area where there isn't oxide, this thick oxide. And historically in the past, um, the dopants were diffused for N plus uh, regions. But usually today we use ion implantation in most fabs, um, but a lot of times we'll still call it a diffusion region, even though it's uh, formed by ion implantation. So, um, so in terminology, we'll still say that this is an N plus diffusion region. So now that the N plus diffusion regions have been implanted, uh, we can strip away all of the oxide and leave just um, straight, you know, silicon again. And you can see that the N plus regions for the source and drain of the NMOS transistor on the left are quote unquote self aligned to the gate because the gate basically prevented the, the implantation from going into the region under the gate. And so that way we have good. Um, good alignment to the gate and the N regions, N plus regions for the NMOS transistor. So here I'm not showing all of the steps, but this, the P plus diffusion will be created through a similar set of steps as we did to form the N plus diffusion. Um, in effect, uh, the, the P plus mask will look like it is shown here. Um, we're going to deposit oxide over the entire wafer 
then we're going to put photoresist over top of it. We're going to expose the regions of the P diffusion mask to the uh, to the photoresist. We're going to uh, basically uh, develop the photoresist and take it away wherever the mask was. Once the photoresist is taken away, we etch the oxide where the photoresist was taken away. Then we take the photoresist away. We're left with just the oxide covering regions we don't want P diffusion. Then we'll implant, uh, use ion implantation to implant P plus uh, dopants wherever there wasn't oxide. Finally, we'll strip away the oxide and be left with the P plus regions. So finally, after all of that, we're going to uh, form the contact areas. Again, we'll put oxide down everywhere. Then we'll put photoresist over top of it. We'll expose the photoresist to the mask. Wherever there's the black regions, the photoresist is going to go away. We're going to develop it. Photoresist goes away. Once the photoresist is, is gone, we can etch the oxide away anywhere there isn't photoresist. And ex, you know basically that oxide will expose the P plus and N plus regions for the metal to contact it. Then we take the photoresist off and we leave the oxide this time because next we're going to put the metal down and we don't want it to connect anywhere except where these contacts are exposing the p plus and n plus regions so finally now we can put down metal um, and what we're going to do is we're going to put metal everywhere um, and then after we put metal everywhere we're going to put photoresist over top of it and we're going to expose that photoresist to an inverse of this particular pattern so that the photoresist will stay wherever we have drawn this uh, blue um, shape and there will be no photoresist in the other places um, so after the photoresist is taken away we can etch the metal away in any region where there is no photoresist and we leave the metal where the blue shapes are shown. And so in this case, um, we wind up leaving the metal wherever we want the contacts. And then once we've gotten rid of the metal that we don't want, then we can take the photoresist off and uh, we're left with just the metal where we wanted it. And so this gives us the final product that we wanted where we have our NMOS and PMOS transistors, PMOS transistor inside the N well with the um, connections to the substrate and connection to the N well, connections to the P source and drain of each of the transistors, um, and our metal connections and polysilicon connection for the gate.